My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a cardiologist in York. Today I am really, really pleased to introduce someone that I've been speaking to over the last couple of weeks. Uh, this is Jonathan Gilbert. Jonathan, you're the owner of DFID Machines. Yes, I am. Excellent. We, we started uh, a couple of years back, well, 2016, uh, with the main focus of trying to address uh, and help people have access to defibrillators, making them affordable and reliable as well. So I, as you know, I'm a cardiologist, and um, you know, I have to say, the most devastating thing is that patient or that person who's not even a patient yet who is completely well and then has a sudden cardiac arrest you know that is absolutely devastating for the family really really scary for everyone who uh you know who knows that person because one minute they're fine next minute you hear that they've died and the problem i have found is that a lot of medical research is based on those people who make it into hospital if we think about it, we don't really do very much for those people who don't make it to hospital. All those people who drop down dead suddenly in the community, what are we actually doing for those people? And to my mind, there are only two things that can help that person, because you can't predict it beforehand. You do start worrying and you start becoming very conscious of your own mortality. Yes. So when I looked into this, I said to myself, well, what are we doing for those people? How do we empower our community to help those people when they need it? And there are two things. One, obviously, resuscitation training. Yeah. And I personally think resuscitation training should be mandatory in schools. You know, everyone should be well versed in re resuscitation. And the main purpose of resuscitation is to allow defibrillation, you know, particularly if patients develop ventricular fibrillation, which is what most cardiac patients, unfortunately, get uh, a rhythm incompatible with life. At that point, the thing that will potentially get them out, their best chance is early defibrillation. Now, I know that lots of centers in the community are now making, are, have now got defibrillators available. And when you got in touch, it became very exciting for me because I wanted to find out how do we do something good for the community and how we go about allowing people better access to good machines which work and which then may just make a huge difference to someone's life. No, absolutely. Um, in terms of the UK, um, we don't have fantastic support. We do not have great response uh, rates. Unfortunately, we have a survival rate of uh, less than 8%, 7.8%. Um, currently, that's on the latest stats that have come out for cardiac arrest. As you mentioned, it's kind of out of hospital we really need to be focusing on, and that's uh, the current stats say there's on average 30,000 uh, a year occurring uh, cardiac arrests and cardiac arrests outside of hospitals. 100 of those a week actually happen in the workplace as well, uh, which is a huge stat. There is the unfortunate truth, we spend a lot of time at work. So if it's going to happen, it is, it is one of the places that um, is likely. The other percentages happen at home uh, or they happen in public places. And it's, it's really making sure that okay, across those three, how can we really spearhead uh, and make sure that we are getting people that quick defibrillation being able to get a defibrillator on someone in the first five minutes is absolutely key. Three to five minutes is ideal. I mean, if you can get on someone as soon as possible, that's the best. Your chances of survival drop by 10% every, every minute that you're looking at. And having a pressure on the NHS or a reliance, um, which I mean, the NHS are absolutely fantastic. Having defibrillators available really provides a support to the NHS that helps uh, the ambulance services job start before they even arrive. Um, if you're able to get a defibrillator on someone, you're not waiting the seven minutes, which is the target time for a category one uh, for a cardiac arrest. That's the target time. In reality, the average is actually 15 minutes. Both of those are too late. Having a defibrillator available and having it within a two minute journey, so two minute to it, two minute back and a minute to administer it, that gives you that five minute window. 
it can increase chances of survival significantly. Having that access in workplaces and communities, um, and really we, sh we should be looking at how we can support people at home as well. But the way that defibrillators are distributed in the UK, there's generally three different options at the moment. So there's funding, um, there's purchase or part funding also falls under purchase, and then there's rentals. The main things that always need to be looked at is quality of device, and what support is actually being provided going forward. Because getting a defibrillator is actually just the start of that journey. Yeah. Um, it doesn't solve the problem all of a sudden and that's going to sit on the wall and work whenever it's needed. It just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So when looking at getting the defib across all of those, you want to make sure that firstly, the device is an FDA approved device. Mm -hmm. It is a standard that's set in the US. Um, it's uh, it's generally recognised across the world as the gold standard. We don't have standards in the UK around defibrillators. We have the CE mark, which will be pointed towards, um, but generally that's just an electrical device uh, being approved. And then there's also um, the Medical Healthcare uh, Regulations Association that will point towards defibrillators, but it is not to the same level of checking that these defibrillators um, are able to perform the things that they're claiming. You've mentioned, so what is staggering is that if I have a cardiac arrest today at home, what you're saying is that there is an 8% chance I'll survive. Unfortunately, that's currently the stats, yes. Is that because that's just the nature of the beast or is it because of a lack of resuscitation training and a lack of defibrillator availability? I mean, education is absolutely key. People understanding how they work, um, as you mentioned at the start, having education in schools is fantastically important. Absolutely. Um, it creates generations of lifesavers. Um, first aid and basic lifesaving are fantastic things to have. In uh, September 2020, it was actually brought in that all school leavers will now learn from 12 years up how to uh, perform first aid and um, basic lifesaving BLS, which makes a huge difference for us all of a sudden. But it's worth three, four years into that now. Um, we haven't got, we've got a huge generational gap. So education is something that is, is really lacking in this country and is one of the reasons uh, which is a barrier to people using defibrillators and the reason why we have these low survival rates. Other countries have been doing this for many years. Um, Nordic countries, Scandinavian, France, Germany, Italy, these, these countries have been doing it for a very long time. Um, you see survival rates in these countries of, of 30, 40%. Really? And there are, there's actually um, Seattle in America um, is even above that. Um, it's a fantastic area for it. And they also have a real program in terms of access to defibrillators in public places, uh, in communities is, is superior to pretty much anywhere else in the world. So why is the government not taking this? Surely that's perhaps the most important thing to do to improve the health of the community, you know, because for lots of people, you know, a cardiac arrest, they're getting on, they're completely healthy, they have a good quality of life, they're getting on, and suddenly out of the blue, they have the cardiac arrest. If you could defibrillate them early, if you could help them survive that, yeah. there's no good reason why they wouldn't continue to go back and live a reasonably good quality of life. Yet, a lot of our focus tends to be on those people who are uh, very sick, who have lots of comorbidities. We've got a, a system called the circuit, the circuit is uh, NHS, Microsoft and uh, British Heart Foundation. They've come together and it's essentially trying to map uh, the available public defibrillators in the UK. It's a, a system in its infancy. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's great in the opportunities that it's giving. Obviously, it isn't perfect yet. There's still a long way to go with it. But it does give us um, a tool that we didn't actually have before. Um, the information previously was just held by the individual ambulance services. So that then became difficult when you were crossing different paths. If you went through to a call handle in a different area, they actually weren't able to access that information. So they will direct anyone to a defibrillator within 200 meters. You're talking about the time that you need to be able to get the defibrillator, being able to provide the CPR as well. That's the kind of distance yeah. that's, that's being used. So my question, I suppose, is in the Scandinavian countries, what are they doing so differently yeah. compared to us? 
the two main points are, and as we mentioned, education and accessibility. It's recommended that you should have refresher training every three years. Um, it's also said that you don't have to be trained to use a defibrillator, and that's true. They are designed that anybody can use them. Mm. They're incredibly simple and they are fantastic. I don't know anybody who the first time they see a defibrillator yeah. working, they want it to be when they're using it in anger. Oh, absolutely. Gosh, I mean, it's so, you know, in theory, it's all very well, but in reality, there are so many other complexities that come into the mix. I mean, I had my, one of my friends died very recently, yeah. again, um, um, and, and his wife noted that he was very unwell. Mm. And she rang and they said, oh, bring him down, pull him down, and then start compressing his chest. But she was saying, well, how do I support his head? What if his head bangs? Well, how? These are very real things. We never think about that. We just think, oh, yeah, drag the person down. But if you're on your own, how do you drag a person who weighs 80 or 90 kilos down? How do you stop them from, from their head from banging? Because that, you know, for a family member, that's horrendous. You know, could yeah. I break the person's neck? Could I do something? So the more that are able to be in places uh, like cities, but also workplaces. Uh, workplaces is a huge one, as I mentioned. 100 a week happening in the workplace is a huge number. And it's, it's the kind of situation that people say, well, it's never going to happen to us. Our, our business was set up with a focus on trying to support um, small, medium-sized businesses be able to provide defibrillators and not breaking the budget um, with that focus of the fact that actually if something like this does happen, it's, it affects the entire workforce. It infects so many people around it. Oh, um, absolutely. So it's making sure that they are available in workplaces, they are available in public places. We're very good in this country at um, having advise, advisory positions. So we will tell people the best position to have a defibrillator. Um, but we don't tell anyone that they have to have them specifically. Which you can take it away. <laughs> what is the one single thing you would do now, knowing that our success rates in terms of resuscitation and survival from cardiac arrest are so low? Yeah. What one thing do you think you could do which could make an immediate impact? Not immediate, but which is going to give you the best bang for your buck in terms of helping the community? So for helping communities, for what we always think, I don't want to sound like a broken record, educating. Um, so we make sure that we're educating people with every defibrillator that goes in. I don't think there should be any reason why a defibrillator is installed and people aren't trained. Mm. There are free tools online, but seeing one on hand first, uh, first impressions is, is really important in knowing that. But there should also be training going forward that should be included. There should be more responsibility on the experts um, who are providing defibrillators. Um, there should be more guidance to understand the types of defibrillators which are effective and making sure those defibrillators are working when they're needed most. They, they can't just be an ornament that are put on the wall and forgotten about. Mm. So I would say educating people so that they know how to use them and going forward they know what to be doing. I would say making sure the defibs were trustworthy and reliable and I would also make sure that people were within a vicinity of being able to do it. So if you are able to add a defibrillator onto the circuit, it's, it's absolutely worth doing. Um, but again, that does link back around with putting ones onto the circuit. It links back around to further support being given from people who are giving the defibrillators out. Mm. If you provide a defibrillator, somebody buys one, puts it onto the circuit to help their local community, and that defibrillator is used, people then have to replenish parts, pads, batteries, they can cost three, four hundred pounds to be doing this. And that can happen a number of times, and that shouldn't be the case for people buying a defibrillator, looking to support, looking to help mm. people going forward. Our stance, is that any defib that is used, there is no bill to it. There's no bill on pads yeah. and batteries because it's like um, buying a laptop for a thousand pounds, going home and then being asked to pay 300 pounds to go on the internet. It's, it has one job. And if that job comes with a bill, you're only going to put people off 
and those defibs are just going to go into disrepair and not work when needed. There's a lot of fantastic work that's gone on with defibs in the last few years and different layers to make sure that people are comfortable, confident, and educated around them. That will be eroded if people aren't looking after them and people start to see that defibrillators aren't working. And that has to come with a responsibility being from the people that are providing them and looking after them, giving that extra care and making sure that people are comfortable in actually using these devices when it comes to it. Because like, like you said earlier, it can be anyone, anyone, any age, any time. There are no signals or signs around it. And it's, it's an unfortunate, terrifying thing. With the way that we work and we replace every defib actually when we've, we've had it used, um, the reason we do that, like I say, there's no bill. We make sure pads and batteries are replaced, but we replace every device within 24 hours. We're making sure that it's available. Um, we're making sure we're not doing our servicing on site. A defib really should be serviced after it's used. The other reason why we really want to do that is there's a human aspect to a defib being used um, and allowing people that clean slate, no matter what the outcome is, we think is just a nice human touch to be doing. So um, when, when I discovered about my friend dying like this, I looked into purchasing a defibrillator for my own home. Yeah. Because the truth is, if you ask me where is the nearest defib, I don't know. Yeah. The second thing that I have to say is I'm a cardiologist, you know, I should be trained in this. But actually, we're only expected to renew our ALS every three years. The whole thing has been made so complex. And the more you start looking into it, so you want to book for yourself on a course, it's like, oh, 2000 pounds. So I found one thing I find very upsetting is that even if you want to learn, mm. you can't access it, partly because they're booked and partly because they're so expensive. The second thing is when I started looking into the defibrillator, I discovered that you could buy a defibrillator for about a thousand pounds or something like that. And I said, okay, that's not too bad. I'll get that. But then my concern was, okay, I can put it in my house, but how do I know it will work when it's needed to work? Yeah. How do I know that my family are going to be adequately confident to be able to use it should the need ever arise. This is the big problem. You, It has to be an active thing and you have to be talking and being educated and uh, by, by the person who's providing it. You want to be able to contact them and get them to come and check it every, and ideally that should happen automatically, shouldn't it? Yeah. It should be a case. So in that sense, that put me off buying it because I thought, well, once I buy it, I'm just, I don't know what to do with it, you know, and maybe it lies there and gets redundant because we don't need to use it. But what happens when we do need to use it? What are, so in that sense, it became very interesting to me when you approached me, because what you're doing is you're renting defibrillators out, aren't you? Yeah. So the way that we provide defibrillators is we are providing them on a rental with a fully serviced and maintained package around it. The reason we've done that is when I originally came across defibrillators, um, I was blown away by the stats and figures around them, but at the same time was completely blindsided by the fact that I'd never come across defibs. I'd been involved in first aid through my life. Um, I'd been um, through martial arts. I had to be a trained first aider in that. Um, I was a trained lifeguard um, and I'd been around uh, first aid, but I'd never come across defibrillators. Um, this was some time back when I was young, but still. Uh, I couldn't understand why that was the process. When I found out about defibrillators, I didn't know why they weren't readily available in the UK. And in understanding that, I did find that there were a couple of main reasons why. As you say, they are expensive to purchase. That can put people off. They don't understand them. We haven't got that education. Uh, as I mentioned, that is going to improve in coming years, but we haven't got that there. And people don't understand the service side. They don't understand the support that's needed. It was generally large companies that had a large budget to be able to spend. Um, they didn't actually mind spending £110 a person to train them um, to spend £200, £300 pounds on pads and batteries every two to four years, um, £1,000 on a defib every five to eight years because these things have lifespans. And the messaging at the same time before we started was also something that was of concern to me. Um, it was very much a case of 
you can get a defibrillator, put it on that wall, and that will be absolutely fine. Mm. And it was, it, there wasn't the responsibility that we now see, which has, it is a slow change, but that is better than no change. What we've seen change since we entered the market, our focus became, as I mentioned, making reliable ADs and affordable reality for everyone. That's our company vision. We want to make sure that people can afford them, that budget isn't a reason to be able to save somebody's life. And if somebody reaches for that defibrillator, they have full confidence that's going to work. That's why we have 100% success rate when a defib is um, used in an emergency as well. So the things that we really we really changed and what we wanted to make sure that were in there was servicing as a standard. Defibrillators are recommended to be checked every two years. Um, and it's not just a case of pressing a button and making sure that it's yes. talking to you. These things, they're professional pieces of medical life-saving equipment. There are very few things like that that people will say that will look after itself. So um, the testing levels that we do, uh, we follow the FDA standards. Um, so we follow the expectations that will be set in states across America. We also follow the standards that will be expected in mainland Europe and some of the countries we've already mentioned that have high uh, survival rates. In doing that, we have seen a complete change in the way that people provide defibrillators now. The same uh, position of these things look after themselves and they're simple is now followed with, but we also provide servicing afterwards. And personally, the more people that do that, the better. It's great to see that responsibility coming around we're hoping that further changes come. We think pads and batteries should be included. That should not be something that customers are paying for. We think training should be uh, included. As you mentioned, that industry, is a, there is a growing industry in that. And there is a lot of reason why that needs to be there with the certification and keeping the qualities. But also, we need to make sure that we're not pricing people out of these things. We need to make sure that people understand them, they have access to it. And not just defibs and that, um, I mean, choking hazards or mm. um, burns. It's, there's a lot of things that are basic things that would help day to day life um, and quality for people. You never know when the defibs next needed. Of course. Um, and we want to be making sure that we are providing it in that time and are making sure that that defib is back up and ready to, to work for if somebody needs it again. So can I ask you, you say your mission is to make it affordable. Yes. That, and that, I think, is the most important thing. How, could you give me an idea of what affordable is? How, 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 much, how much does it cost for me to... If I came to you and I said, look, I have this real dilemma. I've lost two friends out from cardiac arrest. Yeah. I'm in that age group where that could be me one day. Yeah. Uh, I want to do the best I can uh, to try and maximize my chances. So I live in an isolated uh, farm. I would like a defibrillator for my household. Yeah. How much would it cost me? So in terms of rental and the way that we provide it, we include everything that I've mentioned and we do it at a pound a day. A pound a day? A pound a day, yeah. Uh, £365 a year. Um, we've done that to try and make it simple, understood. You can budget for it. There are other options. Um, so if people do want to purchase a device, you can buy one for between £800 and £1,500, which can be expensive. Um, pads and batteries, as I mentioned, every two to four years need replacing, um, and I'd always recommend getting servicing. Some people just will not rent, um, and I'm fine with that. Uh, my mission is not to rent every defib in the country, it's make sure that people know about defibrillators and yeah. actually have access to them. So if people are purchasing them, I would always say, Make sure it's a quality defib. Make sure it is FDA approved. Sure. It is the gold standard and you know that it's going to work. There are many defibs in this country that do not have that level. Um, and it's not for me to say the quality of those, but my trust would always sit in an FDA device. There has been developments and new entrants into the defibrillator market in the UK, um, which can become very confusing. I don't know if you've looked at defibrillators or um, purchasing one, you, you kind of provided with a catalogue of different options and they talk about yeah. biphasic shots, monophasic shots and lithium ion batteries yeah. and it, it all um, is jargon. Ultimately, all you want is something that saves your life. 
Right, right, absolutely. So do you provide this only to companies or can individuals come to you? Uh, how, how do individuals, because you see, all these things become interesting when someone says, some politician comes along and says, oh, we're going to open up a new defibrillator in your community center and every, it becomes a photo opportunity. But, yes. but, but to my mind, I think it's a really good idea that if someone can afford it, to have a defibrillator in their house if, yeah. if you know ideally if you can afford it or at least in your block of flats something that you so at the moment i think that the um initiative is very much on the person who owns the building or the building contractor or the community head or whatever if a person an ordinary person wants to take that initiative and say I think this is a good idea for my family. I think this is a good idea. I've got two uh, parents who've had heart attacks in the past. It's always a possibility. You know, you've already declared yourself having had a heart attack as someone who's at a higher risk. So how do I access it? For a lot of people, they wouldn't even know where to start, you see. Yeah, in terms of, sorry, in terms of ourselves and how we work, we actually only work with businesses currently. Um, which is the only way that we're actually able to, to provide the devices um, at the price that we do. However, um, there are other options. We're not the only company that, that provide them out there. What I would say is you make a really good point about um, photo opportunities with defibrillators. Yeah. There was a bill that was uh, put into Parliament last year which hit the nail on the head. The pads and batteries are just about to run out. And it becomes a burden for the people actually in that area who don't have responsibility mm. for it and don't know what to do or where to start. And as you say, where do you start if you're not aware? So the bill that was actually put forward was for every, um, every new housing development to be provided with a defibrillator, but also with 10 years of support going forward, of service, of maintenance. Yeah. And that's the direction that we really need to be going because that would make a, an initial change overnight. Um, if people had access to defibrillators in the same way that there were those phone boxes originally, um, kind of in the 90s, mm. you would never be that far away from a phone box. If we had that kind of view of a defibrillator as a utility, it would make a huge difference and alleviate a lot of pressure on the NHS and the ambulance service of being able to get there within that five minutes. In terms of supporting communities, we, we recommend every defib that goes into uh, a business to provide that um, to their local community, um, put it on the circuit. It can go in a cabinet or it can be made actually available on the circuit within their working hours. So you can always let it go through that. We can work with um, community groups, we can work with um, sport groups and, and things like that. So we, we are able to provide it, it's just on an individual basis, we're not able to provide them. There are developments and changes that have happened. Um, there's talk of um, personal defibrillators which have differing levels of shock energy to what would be normally seen as, as expected. So um, kind of 120 to 150 joules as an entry, you wouldn't be getting that. That's the kind of thing that, like I say, we would always say, if it's an FDA approved device, we would recommend that, and that's the best angle to go with. But as new defibrillators come out and new angles come out, the main thing that we actually need to be making sure is, is the clinical data there to support, to show that these devices are effective and that they work. If we're able to have more devices available in personal spaces. The finances, I mean, to my mind, a pound a day is very affordable most of the times for something which could actually save your life. <laughs> you have to see what it actually can do, right? And no, in understand. terms of that, even even the idea that actually I'd have to spend five hundred pounds to replace the battery in the past. But that's nothing because it's just saved my life. That's when you're able to do it. <laughs> you know, exactly. So, I mean, I, I think I, it's, it's genuinely very exciting what you're trying to do, the fact that you can make it affordable and the fact that you can maintain it, etc. The only thing that disappoints me is the fact that we cannot make it available to the end user. And it becomes, again, a problem where, where people are beginning to realize that it's the middlemen who are hampering this kind of progress.
the way that we work um, with businesses, we hear about the success stories that we have. Um, we have 100% success with every DFib that's uh, ever been deployed. What does that mean? So every DFib that's been used has saved has, someone's life? Yeah, has worked as wow. exactly how it's meant to. We've got, I mean, we've got some great examples as well of, of DFibs being used. The education facility who placed the defibrillator, uh, we provided a, um, a full site survey, so we checked the campus and we recommended the places to put it. We had seven installed originally. We went around uh, and installed them and provided the training. We took an entire day to train as many members of staff. We had a drop-in centre so that anybody who wanted to see and learn how to use the defib could do that. And we actually provide that every two years still. That defibrillator, uh, one of those defibrillators was used a month later uh, on a 54-year-old lecturer uh, and it saved his life. And the training was actually implemented by somebody who was at one of our drop-in sessions. So it, it shows that process really working in that situation. We've got uh, an example of a venue that we provide to. We provided a site survey uh, with a recommendation of a, a certain number of defibrillators and it was decided that um, less would be needed uh, than that. But at 6 a.m. a contractor in his 40s uh, had a cardiac arrest. One of the devices uh, was retrieved and this person and it saved his life as well. Since then, the venue have increased the number of, um, to the number that was originally provided. There's also different layers provided in cabinets to make them available uh, to the local communities as well, mm -hmm. which is fantastic to see. We provide to um, a huge number of motor dealerships uh, throughout the UK. One of the main reasons is because of working with electric and hybrid vehicles, you have to have a defibrillator available. So there's been a large number that have been provided and we manage large number of fleets for that. Um, we're the only company actually set up to do that in the UK. So we provide that management. We're providing uh, and installing over 100 different sites uh, for this one company. We installed a different uh, defibrillator and um, we put it with the uh, first aid kits and with the burn kit so it was obviously accessible where it was and we did the training. Our technician left and then we had a call from the head office uh, to the head office which told us 45 minutes after that defib had been installed, a customer had had a cardiac arrest in the MOT bay and that defib had saved their life. So these things, the messages that we actually get to hear back mm. are fantastic because we have that contact with an end user as well. It's not a case of um, contact us as and when and maybe if you want to replace your pads and batteries. That maintenance and relationship building is, it provides us that ability to know what is happening and and keep on top giving these successful stories. Knowing what I know, knowing the delays in the system, knowing the fact that the healthcare system is not about individual patients, it's about populations and it's about data and it's about like we saved so many lives and all this kind of stuff. But my life was important. Yes. And you know, whilst you could say, well, we saved eight percent, you know. Well, that one person who doesn't, who isn't that yeah. statistic, that's their whole family deprived of, of, of a breadwinner, of, of you know, so, so. And not just a breadwinner, they lose, yeah, uh, they lose the relationships yeah, that they've had, the absolutely. possible Horrendous. forward. I would say on that, it's, there is a difficulty in the fact that it is a system that needs to, yeah. to be fixed absolutely and the exactly. starting point there has to be a starting point to get to an end point yeah. and to be able to catch up with our neighbors to be able to catch up with other western developed countries that are showing much better response rates we need to start from a certain point and being able to provide a reliable network that people have confidence in that are kept up to date and setting that as a as a ground standard for people who are providing them that will allow us to have these building blocks. And then once we're able to provide as a community, the next step obviously from that is that personal yeah. position, um, which as you say, it's, it's the exact position you want to be in because I feel important to me <laughs> um, and I feel important to the people around me, but um, it's being able to provide en masse and being able to make sure we can protect that and then we can start to filter down but making sure, we've got to make sure we walk before we run with that.
in terms of cardiac arrest and, uh, and heart attack. Obviously, there's a, a real difference in those two that the layperson may not know. Um, I feel like you are probably far better placed to actually explain that than I would be. Ultimately, the issue is this, that a cardiac arrest is when the heart is not generating any kind of meaningful contraction to push blood around. So cardiac arrest is the same as death. There are lots of things that can lead on to cardiac arrest. So, you know, you could uh, bleed someone to the point that they have no blood left and eventually they die of cardiac arrest. Yeah. But the most common cause of unheralded cardiac arrest is usually a heart attack in middle-aged people. So in what happens in those people is that over a period of time, they develop wear and tear of their heart arteries through bad lifestyles, etc. And sometimes it can just be genetics, sometimes it can be age, sometimes it could just be bad luck. But for some reason, a vessel blocks off. And when that vessel blocks, the heart, the, the, the territory of the heart that that vessel is supplying with blood will suffocate. And when it suffocates, the heart starts dying. And at that point, uh, the heart may develop heart rhythm disturbances, which render it ineffective. So ineffective that no blood comes out. And that is a cardiac arrest. So a heart attack is not the same as a cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest is death unless you do something to yes. actively reverse it. A heart attack may not necessarily result in cardiac arrest, but, but the problem is people develop the blockage and then they get the cardiac arrest and then they don't get resuscitated in time. They don't have access to things like defibrillators. And by the time they get to hospital or by the time uh, they get help, too much damage has been done. And therefore, it is not possible for the heart to recover its function. And that is why time is so important. That is the, the idea is you want time equates to how much damage is happening to the heart. The quicker you can get them out of the cardiac arrest, the more likely it is that you will be able to save them. And the more likely it is that they won't be left with permanent damage, particularly to the brain. And that is why it's so important. I mean, the basic of that, um, if the heart's not working, there's not a lot else going on. Um, yeah. and, and just to simplify for my mind, uh, what you're saying, cardiac arrest is um, the electrics and heart attack is the plumbing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Ultimately, everything boils down to the fact that the heart as a pump is unable to pump out any meaningful amount of blood. Yeah. And so everything starts suffocating. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to restore the pumping function. Yeah. And sometimes you can do that by resynchronizing the electricity, which is becoming chaotic. And that is what defibrillation does. Yeah. But of course, it is possible that the heart becomes so weak that even if you resynchronize it, the heart is permanently damaged and therefore the person will have another cardiac arrest and another cardiac arrest, sometimes in quick succession within a course of minutes. And that is, again, why it is so important to minimize damage by getting in there as soon as possible. And so it's a simple uh, case of making things available so, and accessible so that you can get in there quickly. And the problem is that even seven minutes is late, yeah. uh, but the reality is with ambulances, etc., it's 15 minutes, yep. and then on top of that, if you add in them coming into the house, then putting the things on, working out what's going on, that's already going into 20 minutes, yep. and that is why the survival rate goes down with, as you say, with every minute, the survival rate is going down, down the likelihood of long-term damage is going up. Yeah, and the, the obviously um, following on from a successful resuscitation of people going to the hospital, it's it's often that you would have an ICD fitted. Um, I've been asked on many occasions about ICDs and also pacemakers and defibrillators. What's the position with that? And I, I know there's there's a lot of worry from people. Um, my view is always that. Um, if if somebody has gone into cardiac arrest in that situation, they have a pacemaker or an ICD. 
those things haven't done the job that they're meant to be doing. Um, so a, a defibrillator will take them out of cardiac arrest and give them the opportunity to get to hospital and, and will they'll be able to um, make sure that those devices are working. But I'm guessing that people will usually get those devices because the heart's been weakened by the heart attack in the prolonged period. Yeah, so this is the thing that I do. I mean, the, the, at the moment, implantable defibrillators are reserved for those people that we think are highly likely to develop a cardiac arrest, so people with weak hearts. Yeah. But the problem with people with weak hearts is that you're not reversing that weak heart. You are just reversing the likelihood of the cardiac arrest. They're still going to be left with a weak heart. So the substrate hasn't been taken away. It's like a crutch. It's a, like a crutch. And in some ways, you know, particularly those people who are really sick, maybe you're doing them a disservice by putting in a defibrillator because you are prolonging life at the cost of anything, right? Whereas the young guy who's working, who's happy, who's playing tennis, suddenly collapses. Now the thing is, he is otherwise healthy. This has just yeah. been an isolated incident. Yeah. You go get in there, shock him quickly, have the, if there's a blockage, relieve the blockage, and he goes back to a normal existence. He obviously be left traumatized by it, yes. but physically he's able to do all those things. You have actually genuinely saved his life mm -hmm. and allowed him to go back to a good quality of life. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, the rationing is such that defibrillators or implanted defibrillators are only reserved for those people who are really sick, who have got very bad hearts, etc. Yeah. Uh, so. I'm not saying that those people should not be offered that, but I do think there is something to be said for those people who are really healthy, who are doing everything, and if they have a heart attack out of the blue and left with a bit of a scar, they should have access to defibrillators because that scar itself can become the substrate for future cardiac arrests. That's interesting. I think it's initiatives like this that are gonna make a difference to the community. I really do, I mean, this is what we need. And I'm so glad that you got in touch. Perfect. No, it's been great to actually be here and talk and be able to talk passionately about something oh. that I am passionate about. Really nice talking to you. Thank you Thanks so much. much. Yeah. Cheers.